In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I want to begin by telling you about a young woman from Nigeria and her experience as a university student here in America. Her name is Chimimanda. When she first arrived in this country at age 19, her American roommate wanted to know where she had learned to speak such good English. And the roommate was surprised to learn that English is the official language of Nigeria. The roommate then asked to hear some of her tribal music and was confused when Chimamaya produced her favorite Mariah Carey CD. <laughs> to Chimamanda's American roommate, the vast continent of Africa was a place of beautiful remote landscapes and exotic animals and a primitive people who were unable to speak for themselves and who needed to be saved by those in the so-called civilized world. This was the story of Africa that the roommate had been told as an American. Chimamanda calls this the danger of the single story. The danger of the single story. Because of America's cultural and economic power, the stories that it tells, the pictures that it paints about people and places considered other, have a very broad and strong influence. When the story of an entire population is told with a single, simplified narrative or storyline, that single story often becomes the reality to those who hear it. But as Chimamanda said, I have always felt that it is impossible to engage properly with a place or a person <coughs> without engaging with all of the stories of that place or person. The consequence of the single story is this. It robs people of dignity. Stories matter. Stories can break the dignity of, of people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. I wonder how many of us, in hearing the story this morning of David and Bathsheba, cringed or felt some other visceral reaction. I did many times as I read it this week. To speak of it lightly and politely, it is a story of broken dignity. To speak of it bluntly and honestly, it is a story of rape and murder and cover-up and egregious abuse of power by a man over a woman and over another man in a less powerful position. And yet it's easy to just gloss over it as one of those single stories with characters that become representative of a role like king or servant or an attractive woman. And the actions and responses of those characters can easily be brushed aside as the norm for the time, for the culture, or the role. David was the king, after all, a long-reigning and powerful man who ravaged the armies of other nations, a man who had his servants bring an attractive woman to him and then sent her back when that particular conquest was done. Well, hadn't Israel demanded a king like all the other nations around them? They did. And hadn't God, in the first book of Samuel, 
given the people fair warning about how a king would behave, he will take your sons, he said. He will take your daughters. He will take your fields. He will take your grain. He will take your slaves and your flocks. As it's told, this is the single story of those granted the power of the throne. He will take and take and take. It's striking to see, as we read forward, how the apparent acceptance of this particularly heinous story is almost immediately followed by one like it, the rape of Tamar by David's son, Amnon. And that this particular storyline follows David all the way to his deathbed, as told in the beginning of the first book of Kings. As David was shivering with cold as he died, his servants said, let a young virgin be brought and let her wait on the king. Let her lie in your bosom, Lord, so that you may be warm. They found a young girl who was very beautiful. She came and became the king's attendant and served him. But this time, the author thought it was important to add, lest we wonder about it, the king did not know her sexually. And what about Bathsheba? She has nothing to say in this story for all the trauma she experiences. The child conceived that day in David's palace dies as an apparent punishment for David's sin. Yet popular culture tells us the single narrative that Bathsheba was a harlot and a temptress, if we pay attention to the, to the video and film versions of this story from the 1950s and 60s, and if we pay attention to the way that women are still called to account when they speak out after sexual assault, what were you wearing? Why were you out alone? This single narrative, broad brush stroke stories told by those with power become true, particularly for those without power. The prevalent abuse of power in the form of sexual assault has come into greater light recently as women telling their stories loudly and firmly have become too frequent to ignore. We have experienced this in the emergence of the Me Too movement, starting back in 2017 and up into this year. Yet even in this case, it was those in power whose stories seemed to influence the course of history. What is not widely known is that the Me Too movement was founded in 2006, 12 years ago, or something like that. My math is not good. It was founded back then to help poor women, mostly women of color, to find resources and support following sexual assault and to combat violence in their communities. For all the progress that's been made in the last 18 months or so, as the Me Too movement came to the fore and came to our awareness, it took the women who have power in the entertainment industry to bring it there. So what does all of this have to do with church? You may be wondering. You may be thinking, isn't Joanne delivering a political message from the pulpit? If that is one of your reactions, I respect that. And I'm always aware of the fact that Jesus was indeed a political figure in that he sought to upend the status quo and dismantle the abuse inherent in the power structures of his day. And if Jesus was guilty of telling a single narrative story, it was this, that we love one another. 
that we lift up and care for those who are abused by those with power. At the General Convention of the Episcopal Church earlier this month, amid the usual talk of revising the prayer book and other church politics, a special liturgy of listening was held on July 4th. This service was planned by the House of Bishops and a pastoral response to the Me Too movement. And this liturgy gave space specifically for the bishops of our church gathered there to speak aloud 12 stories, six from men, six from women, who have been victims of sexual misconduct perpetrated by someone in the church. One was a candidate for ordination who was abused by her bishop. One was a young man who was abused by his priest's wife. And there were other equally disturbing and heart-wrenching stories. In his opening prayer, Presiding Bishop Michael Curry called the gathering a sacred container of abuse that never should have happened. And in that sacred space, the bishops publicly offer lament and confession to the church's role in sexual harassment and abuse. And all those present gave witness and held these stories up in sorrow and in the hope for healing and rebuilding trust. When the stories of individuals become simplified into a single narrative about a group, the experiences of individuals get lost. Hurts and hopes, fears and dreams remain unspoken and unheard. The power of healing stalls. Without healing, we are unable to grow into the fully human beings that God intends for us all to be. Let's be aware of and look for opportunities to name our hurts and to offer healing. This is the work of the church to show consistently that our actions match our words, that we are a welcoming and safe place for people to bring all that they carry with them into this place, a safe place where everyone can be heard, a sacred space where everyone can know they will not be judged and they will not be hurt. <coughs> My hope for all of us here, all of us who are not here, is that the words we have been praying for our parish may come fully to fruition, that the richness, diversity, and gifts of each person here will be treasured and used, that we view times of change and turmoil as an invitation to build up the foundation which has been given to us at St. Matthias, a transformative community of faith. And that in the words of presiding Bishop Curry, we are ever mindful to live into our baptismal vows, working for justice and reconciliation with one another and with God. That is the work of all God's people.